In recent months, a group called, uh, well, a group called Stop Co-Governance have been touring this country presenting one view on that issue. A view that suggests that we are paying too much attention to the Treaty of Waitangi and a particular policy, ill-defined as it may be, called co-governance, which appears to grant a certain group of people, Māori on their ethnicity, um, representation on certain statutory bodies and local government boards that because of their ethnicity. Uh, the Stop Co-Governance Roadshow, we'll call it, has been organised by uh, Julian Batchelor, who I understand is a lay pastor and has been involved in, in uh, property development and real estate and the like. And Julian's published a book, which he is, uh, I think, either selling or giving away to people. And his tour around the country has attracted much uh, controversy and much debate. Uh, they're not public meetings that are held anymore for co-governments. They're private meetings because that was the advice of the police. When a group of rather uh, radical, um, I would say, uh, in, in my estimation, protesters called Aotearoa Liberation Alliance and World well, League uh, were set up and they have tried to counter these private meetings up and down the country and there's been plenty of headlines about it. Julian Batchelor is going to be one of the participants in our debate this morning. The other is a man called Buddy McCarty, who I've known for a few years and had the odd beer with. Buddy McCarty is Māori. He lives near Tauranga, uh, if by the best of my recollection. Uh, Buddy is an author and historian and a consultant. In that wonderful way that people are consultants on things like the Resource Management Act uh, and environmental matters. Buddy was uh, closely involved in the clean-up after RENA and the issues that happened after the RENA disaster. Uh, he's dabbled in politics. And Buddy has come out and said of the co-governance meetings, and he protested one a few days ago, he says they are particularly racist. Well, are they? And what is going on here? And can these two men find some meetings of minds? We are joined now for a debate by, and I don't know who's older, but I suspect it's Buddy, so we'll give we'll introduce him first. Buddy McCarty, how are you? <laughs> Kia ora. Good morning, Sean. Good to hear from you. Nice to have you with us. And I thank you very much, Buddy, uh, for agreeing to come on and, and debate and discuss uh, with Julian. And uh, also joined, of course, by Julian Batchelor. Well, I suppose the founder and the spokesperson for Stop Co-Governance. Julian, thank you for joining us this morning. Great, thanks for having us on, Sean. Hello, buddy. All right. Now, do you two know each other? You ever met before? No, no I've never met, know. buddy. All right. Well, you do now. Okay. Now, I call this a debate. What are the rules? The rules are that we treat each other with respect. We speak our minds um, honestly, openly and frankly. We try not to yell at each other if, if possible. Um, and I guess I'm the boss, guys, uh, though... In many ways, it's up to you, you both, how this goes. I, I first want to start by just defining what we're talking about. Um, Julian Batchelor, as, in, as succinctly as you can, can you tell us what you believe co-governance is? Co-governance is the elite Maori takeover of New Zealand. That's what it is. And... Um, a Haipuapua report insisted that full power and authority must go to Māori by 2040. And that is under the United Nations Declaration of the Right of Indigenous People, right? No, it was in the Haipuapua report. Yeah, yeah, which and makes then, reference to that. So you are then, saying that, that co-governance is a power grab by the upper echelons of Māoridom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. And that therefore you oppose it on what grounds? That it's illegal because it's not mandated in the treaty. The treaty guaranteed equality for all New Zealanders. And you believe that co-government gives, gives what? More than equality to Māori? Absolutely. There's, it, it was tr It's treason. Because the treaty made it very clear that all New Zealanders were to be equal. And there's 160 cultures living here. 
And so each of those cultures should be treated equally. And we're all settlers here. Maori came here to about 1250. They were settlers. They're not indigenous. They arrived here like the rest of us, including all the Filipinos and the Samoans and the Czechs and the Croatians and every other culture that's here. And the treaty... Right, hang on, hang on, no buddy, you're going to get a crack. <laughs> yeah. The treaty okay. makes no, makes, gives no mandate to co-governance or partnership all right all. okay thank you thank you julian buddy that's what julian thinks co-governance is and that's what one presumes at his meetings and i have not been to one that is what he is saying at his meetings <coughs> firstly do you have a response to that and what is your definition of co-governance oh uh, i think they could have used a better term and my term would have been co-management rather than co-governance um, but in any, any respect, um, it's already here, uh, Sean. No, no, um, I didn't so ask whether it was here or not, buddy. I asked what it is. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to give you an example. So as an example of what colour go go governance looks like, um, you can look to the Māori Woods system that's been set up. Um, and in the Bay of Plenty where Julian was yesterday, uh, we have a very good example with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, which was among the very first in the country to have... Māori wards. Um, and so all that means is that you have the ability to take into account the Māori perspective on things. And I was very interested to see another example just last week between Mighty River Power and Tainui, where um, Mighty River Power have invited Tainui membership of, the, of their board, um, and that's on the basis that I knew he must know something about this river because they've lived beside it for the last several hundred years. Um, and so it's, it's recognising that in performing the functions of running their company, that it's helpful to them to have a Māori perspective on things. Um, and simply put... That's Did, were Māori in them. any way utilising hydroelectric power technology? No, but they were utilising the river, Sean. Right. Okay. All right. So you say it is a benign cooperative model to get the most out of a particular group in society who have a particular perspective? No, I'm just saying that it's it's a reflection of the way New Zealand society is going and that we're looking for a, a shared... Um, where we, where, we, where we have knowledge which uh, is useful to us as a community, we can share that in a uh, formal way. And that's all that this is. Okay, so Māori have special knowledge? Well, they have knowledge which you don't normally meet. Yes, that's true. Okay, can you give me an example in relation to hydroelectric power where Māori have a special perspective? Well, you know... <laughs> They've, they've fished that river, for example, for centuries, right? And so they want um, that particular activity to be taken into account in the production of hydroelectricity. So um, I'm not sure how it works on the Waikato, but I do know that um, on other rivers there are particular times where the floodgates are open to allow the eel migration to take place, for example. Um, we have a transfer of fish from below the dams to above the dams. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of the Matatar project in the Bay of Plenty, for example, a good example of that. And so it's really taking into account the Māori perspective, but it's also an environmental um, aspect to it as well. Now, that can only be good for all of us, Sean. Okay. All right. So, buddy, that sounds a very benign, very feel-good idea the idea of what you would call co-management rather than co-government. Julian, what on earth is wrong with that? Oh, you know what? It's laughable. What about the perspective of the Chinese and the Indians and the French and all the other 160 cultures? Why aren't they coming in with their perspective? And, you know, all the settlers have been fishing and they know all about the eels and they know all about the fish. Come on. This is ridiculous. Um, 
So now, you would yeah, reject yeah, Buddy's yeah, argument yeah, that yeah. there is a specific perspective or historical knowledge there that is useful or unique? No, what I'm saying is this, you know, that there's 160 cultures here. Why aren't they all being consulted? Why, why just marry? Because they just settlers here like everybody else. There needs to be equality. And, you know, if, if, they, if they have a, a view about how the fish swim up the river to the dam and they chuck these fish in and eels and so forth, well, big deal. You don't need a PhD to know about that. And you don't need a married perspective. But I'm saying this, that we should have all the perspectives in New Zealand being, being, being listened to from all the cultures. Why is it just Ewe? What's, what's special about them? Well, what is special about you, buddy? Well, that's not entirely a uh, reflection, Sean. I mean, when there's an important issue, um, the who, whoever is putting forward the proposal or the or the idea, um, they are subject to public consultation like every other project is. And so you have all those other ethnicities, they do have the opportunity to contribute if they do. Now, um, saying that... But, our, but I think what Julian was Indian asking is what makes you so special? Or Māori so we special? Were, we were here first and we've been here first. So we've been here the longest. So therefore you would think that having been here the longest, we might have more, more knowledge maybe. Yeah? Yeah. Well, or some might say we, they would look at the history of Māori, particularly the early history of Māori pre-European and say that environmentally you guys were a disaster. You, you were, More species went extinct under the time of Māori uh, occupation of New Zealand than have uh, since European arrived. You, you hunted the moa to extinction. It was a, basically, go to a certain place, completely and utterly suck out the natural resources and move on. <laughs> I don't think we should start down that track. Well, well why not? I mean, I'm sorry, I, I only really found out about that um, through watching a, uh, a Radio New Zealand documentary series on early Maori settlement that said they would go from, like, river mouth to river mouth uh, take all the food and everything and then move on. And, and if we look at, you know, the extinction of species in New Zealand, it's hardly a kind of uh, a shining environmental record, is it? Well, you know, you live and learn in the environment, don't you? And so when you arrive in a new place, obviously, you know, you've got a lot to learn. And over time, you do learn what works and what doesn't work. And um, very sorry that uh, there are no longer more here in this country. But, you know, if we want to look at the impact of colonisation, for example, we can well, have I didn't bring colonisation. Well, I suppose some colonisation. All right, buddy. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, you know, we, we can have lots of other examples of how colonisation has been very harmful, not just to the environment, but to the people involved as well. So, um, you know, <laughs> we're talking over a span of time uh, how things have, ha have worked out, what we've learned during that time, and, uh, you know, right here in the Coromandel, for example, where I am this morning, um, we currently have a scallop prohibition on scallop fishing. And that's because too many people have been taking scallops. So the Māori solution is to apply a rahui, which is a ban mm. on taking those, those fish until they recover. Um, so, you know, you, you, you learn about your environment over time. And mm. all we're trying to do, I think, in these instances is put that knowledge into effect mm. your response julian oh you know again this is ludicrous mari arrived here about 1250 europeans arrived in number numbers about 1800 for 600 years mari did nothing in new zealand absolutely nothing when the europeans came here they found that mari didn't even have shoes and they hadn't even invented the wheel <coughs> and yet they're coming across as the people with all this knowledge, and they did nothing for 600 years in New Zealand. And it wasn't until the colonials arrived that we set up government, schools, systems. Well, our side type of government, hospital. to be fair, Julian. Yeah, but it was it was it was set up by the colonials, and the country actually took off once the colonials arrived. The other thing is that, you know, Murray were not the first people here. Maori, Moriori were here. There was a good evidence that Celtic people were here. So, but it doesn't it doesn't matter because there's now we're living in 2023. There's now 160 cultures here. We should all be consulted. If you say that you're going to 
you know, the scallop beds needs to be closed down for a while. You don't need Murray to tell you that. You can just have the Ministry of Fisheries, the old one, used to look at, he used to do all the science around fish stock taking and they can close it down. Why, why is it Murray who close it down? Mm. Why not the Chinese close it down? I mean, you know, what's going on here? Why, why do they have the say in all this? Mm. Shouldn't oh. we be consulting with all the 160 cultures? Yeah. We should. You know, like I was, I was with the mayor of Waimati and we were sitting down in his office and talking to him and I said, hey, getting on? And he said, oh, we have a good relationship with the, with the, um, with the iwi here and they push things across the line for me and I push things across the line for them. I said, that's very good. Well, what about how are you getting on with consulting with the Filipinos who are most of the far using, you know, the labour of most of the um, farming community? What about the Indians? What about the Thai people? What about the Czech people? What about the Croatians? What about the Dutch people? Mm. What about the... So the you would live in your ideal world, Jelly, in a place where the, you know, the fact is, Buddy said, we came, we were here first, or we were here before Europeans, whether or not anyone was there before them. Um, you know, history's rolled on, uh, and they're not culturally powerful now or involved in this debate. So you're just saying we would have a world where every ethnicity, every minority is treated the same and we don't have, as Willie Jackson, I think, has said, a country where Maori are special or do have different or specific rights. Correct. Okay. Buddy, because, Buddy, because you're... Yeah, you're yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Buddy, you're yeah. quoted in the Herald as saying the co-governance uh, roadshow and what Julian's doing and the views he's just espoused are particularly racist. Um, why is that? Well, we had a meeting in Mount Monganui last night that I was outside of. Um, I was told by the people on the door that I would not get in because I'm not a good Māori. <clears throat> now, this is a supposedly public event. Um, no, it's not actually, it, buddy, if you paid attention. <laughs> Well, um, I just say the, my understanding is that because of the disruption caused by groups like the Aotearoa Liberation League, Julian was obliged, uh, advised by police, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julian, to make these private events so that he no, could no, provide no, security. No. Is that right, here's Julian? My, here's, my, here's my invitation, Sean, to hear Julian Batchelor, the author of this booklet, give an eye-opening and inspiring public lecture on mm. co-governance, what it is, why it's wrong and why it must be stopped. Mount Monganui Community Hall, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's free. Invite friends and family. It's free. Now, that's an invitation to enter, isn't it? Um, Julian, you want to respond to that? It's a private meeting, but the public's invited, so we filter people at the door. We're not racist in any way whatsoever. We filter <laughs> people according to, the, according to their behaviour and according to their attitude. If they're, if they're going to wreck the meeting... And if they are activists who want to shout things out and be disrespectful to when I'm talking, then they're not allowed in. And so we open it to the entire public, but we filter people at the door. And it's not according to the colour of their skin. It's according to their attitude and their behaviour. And so well, it's on, worked very well. That, that was following. Right that was following. Well, but, Hang on, yeah, you okay. I didn't interrupt you, buddy. That was, that was following police advice, and we followed that, and it worked like a dream. It's working perfectly. All right. So and Julian, so Julian is saying that isn't racism, buddy. That is discretion to ensure that people inside that meeting do not try and disrupt and stop that meeting. That's not I, really I was, racist, is it, buddy? I was there at the door, Sean. And the first criteria for judging whether someone's going to get in or not is what colour are you? And brown people were stopped and questioned. Now, you know, how do you determine uh, beforehand whether someone's, uh, in their own words, a good Māori is going to sit there quietly or one is going to ask sensible questions? You know, it's, that, that, that's part of it. I don't know how you determine that. Um, when the first criteria they're using is you're a brown person, you're not coming in. Julian, do yeah. you discriminate on the grounds like of, well, ethnicity, apparent ethnicity by the colour of someone's skin when you admit people to your meeting? I, I, know, I know that what, what um, Buddy just said is the biggest porky ever uttered by a Māori in Tauranga because we don't filter people according to the colour of their skin. We never have. In fact, we had a we had 25 Māori in our meeting, last meeting down in 
in uh, Christchurch. We have Māori in every single meeting. And, you know, <laughs> those Māori who come, at the, the Māori that we've let in, who are genuine, respectful people, if we, we, they wait till the end. We always have a Q&A time at the end of every conference, and they wait like everybody else. And the, and doesn't matter, we have Chinese in there, we have all sorts of ethnicities come into our meetings. They all wait to the end for the Q&A time. And if they don't, we turf them out. That's how it works. And if anybody, doesn't matter what the colour of their skin, if people start interrupting halfway through the meeting, and we've had white woke people in there, and uh, they get turfed out. So it's got nothing to do with the colour of your skin. It's got to do with your behaviour and your attitude and your respectfulness. And we wouldn't do that on a marae. If I came onto a marae, I wouldn't be shouting things out and throwing things around, ripping up books. Wouldn't dare do that because I have more respect for people than that. But Mar a activist Maori don't do that. They, they have no respect. So we don't let them in. That's how it is. Buddy, would you have gone to that meeting and let it proceed without trying to disrupt it? Oh, of course. And, you know, the thing is to get your point across. You're not going to get your point across if you're yelling and screaming at the back of the room. And what's your point? Oh, buddy, we'll just try and get Buddy back. We've just had a drop off, so we're just going to hold Julian if we can because um, something happened to his line there. We're not quite sure. Um, just a second. We'll just see what happened there. Okay, and I think we've got him. I think we've got him. Okay, we're just going to see if we got him back again. Okay, we got you back, buddy, I think. Um, indeed, we have. We can put him to air. Okay, yep. sorry, buddy, I don't know what happened there. Okay, so you're saying you would be happy to go to a meeting and not say anything and not disrupt it? Of course. Um, you know, there's an opportunity to do that, as Julius just said, at the end of the meeting, which is where you make your point. Mm. But um, I, w I wouldn't have got in, mainly because I've spoken out against it in public uh, already. So, yeah. you know, do they want an open debate or not? I don't yeah, think here's so. a question for you, buddy. Do you think that Julian should be allowed to have these meetings? Because a lot of people who protest against this quite vehemently have tried to shut him down have tried to influence people who, and have influenced groups like the Scouts who have hired halls out to pull back and basically try and, and stop him having a venue to discuss his views of co-governance. Oh, it, it was the nature of how they set those up, Sean. You right. Know, um, denying people entry... No, no, but, the, but, buddy, they're allowed to. You, you don't have a party and invite gate crashes. Yeah, but that, who says they're going to be gate crashes? It's up you to know, that, you. know, if you hire a judgment. venue, if you hire a venue, you have the right to deny entry, buddy. Yeah, but if you hire a venue and then invite people to come and then deny them entry on the basis that you're a brown person and you could yeah, be but a we've bad just, person, I think we've just established that know. wasn't the issue <laughs> that you are here to dis disrupt the meeting or not let our private meeting proceed. Right. So I've already said. Um, Sean, that uh, that would not be my intention. It would be to have a sensible discussion. But um, you're being denied the ability to do that straight away. Okay. Do you believe that Julian Batchelor should be able to hire venues, be they council-owned or anything else owned, and discuss his views? Is that okay with you? It's okay with me as long as they are free and open events. Because well, well, no, 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 uh, hang on, hang on. That's not my question. Yeah. They're not free and open events. He's playing for the hall. He's got a point of view he wants to get across. He's sharing his views or his organisation's views. Do you think he should be allowed to do that? Hang on. Let's just move it back one, one step. <clears throat> so this is a community facility which has been set up to uh, for the benefit of the community which it services, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Here is someone who is purporting to have a public meeting in a community No, he's not. He's not. Yeah. I think we've been over this a number of times, buddy. On the advice of police, Stop Co Governance made them private meetings so they could screen at the door to stop the farce of disruption and protest that had occurred. Okay. Well, I'm saying that that wouldn't have occurred with me. But nevertheless, okay. I was denied entry. Okay, you were denied entry. So is this personal for you, buddy? And I ask you again, do you believe that Julian Batchelor, whether you agree with his views or not, has the right to hire venues 
and have private meetings or invite people into meetings to hear his views? He has that ability to do that. Does he have the right? I'm, I'm, I'm not disputing that, but I would dispute the nature of the content of that meeting, though. And you're allowed to from outside, and that you've had lots of media. One of the reasons you're here today, buddy. <laughs> do you think Julian Batchelor is a racist, buddy? Yes, I do. Do you want to respond to that, Julian? Well, how does he know he hasn't been in the meeting? Well, because you won't let him into the meeting, <laughs> Julian. Let's be honest. He's a, he, he was allowed. He's allowed into the meeting. He was there for three. Apparently, I wasn't on the security at the door, but apparently, Buddy was outside for for, for three of the for three of the meetings we've just had. That's not in the and meeting, we were, Julian. We were, pardon? That's not in the meeting. That's outside the meeting. I know, but he was invited to come in. No, I wasn't. Tell me, tell me I was one thing. Hey, just one thing. Hang on, just tell me one thing, buddy. Just give me an example of something that I've said that's racist. Just one thing. Uh, I don't know where to start, Sean. I've got a, I've got a copy of the booklet here, and it's just full of innuendo, rubbish. Um, give us an example, though, buddy. That's what Julian asked for. Yeah, 2014. Maoris are going to rule the country. Really? How does he come to that, that, that arrangement? Is that racist or his opinion, which he's allowed to express in a democracy, buddy? <laughs> buddy? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. <clears throat> I think it's racist because it's specifically targeting Māori as being um, the root cause of all the issues that Julian's worried about. Uh, do you agree with that, Julian? Do you think Māori are the problem in New Zealand? Just what Buddy just said. Māori, through the Hei Pūpū report, through my Tikimai Aotearoa, have said that Māori want to have full control and authority of New Zealand by 2040. I didn't say that. Māori said that. So Māori are the racists, not me. I'm just reporting what's in the public domain, buddy. Name names. Who? The, the authors of the Hei Pūpū report. You should know who they are. Yeah, and, and who are they? Clear Charteris. Who are they? Clear Charteris. <laughs> It's like saying that the people, the parking people outside your meeting last night protesting are your people. You should know. So there's a range of opinion across the board. There's a range of opinion across the board, Julian. Some, some people in our community are of that view, others are not. But you can't lump them all together and say you represent the, the, the opinion. Um, which you disagree with. That, that's, that's, not, that's not logical. It's very logical. If it's coming out of the government and it's in the public domain and we pick up on it and we say this is what's being planned at the top levels of Maridom, then all the public need to know and that's why we're having public debates and public... Um, well, I don't know that you are having public meetings, Julian. You're having meetings that are open well, to opening, members we're, of the public. We're opening... We're opening the discussion to the public, to anybody who wants to be respectful, yeah. who wants to come in and listen and ask questions at the end. So that's what we're doing. Okay, and the Prime, but, Minister, yeah. the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have both exhorted New Zealanders to do this, so we're obeying them. And I'm actually having a fantastic tour, and the amount of support has just gone through the roof. It's unbelievable, the okay. amount of Kiwis who are signing up to follow this. <laughs> we are not going to resolve this today. I'm good, but I ain't that good. Um, <laughs> but look, I am going to say this. I, I am grateful to you both for coming and talking to each other, largely with respect, uh, though you clearly do not agree. I'm just trying to look for a, a slight way forward or a chink in the armour here. Um, not a chip, well, not a chink in the armour, some, some way to develop this. Buddy, would you, would you go to a meeting of, of Stop Co Governments, listen and, and take the opportunity to ask questions at the end without <laughs> trying to shout anyone down or scream racist at anyone? I don't think I need to do that, Sean. We've had um, uh, good Pākehā people 
uh, attend the meetings, uh, giving me a full breakdown of what goes on in there. Um, I don't think I'd gain anything useful from being okay, here so anyway. So you're not going to and, engage? And I think, and no, I think you put your finger on it already, Sean, that um, the, the two views are not reconcilable from what I can see Well, they anyway. have to be because we all live together, buddy. <laughs> We've got to find well, a way. I, I, there, there is a solution, Sean. And um, the solution that I'm looking at is that the particular demographic that Julian appeals to is ageing. And, um, you know, as my father said, you've got to live with, uh, with what God gives you. And so we've got these people who... Um, let them outside, please, hon. Um, so um, the New Zealand of the future is going to be a different one to what we have here today. And most people that Julian aspires to um, have on his camp, um, they're all going to die. <laughs> and their grandchildren will take our country forward, and their grandchildren already are part of the evolution of our community and society, um, Sean. I mean, these are the kids who now stand up and very proudly... OK, but do you, do you think name. that the Hipuapua report... I presume you've read the Hipuapua report. Well, I haven't, actually, because, you know, it just represents a particular portion yeah. of the Māori community. OK. OK, and you'd say a more radical or ambitious one? Well, yeah, the same as there are in the wider community. You have okay. you know, a range of opinions, right? And that's just one end. All right. So you don't, you won't go to a stock co-governance meeting, even though you started this debate today saying you were upset that you weren't let in. Julian Batchelor, would the invitation still stand to Buddy to come along and listen? You know what, Buddy? You get a thousand Maori onto Marae and, and Tauranga, or as many as you like, I'll come and speak. How's that? I'm all for the brown-skinned people. In fact, I'm working for the average Māori, and I'm batting for them. And if you were in the meetings, you would see that. And last night, I asked the packed house at that community hall at the very end. I said, so what do you think? Am I racist? The answer was absolutely not. Am I batting for Māori? Absolutely. Are you batting for, am I batting for the 160 cultures living in New Zealand? Absolutely. It was unanimous. And if you'd been in there, you would have seen that. So you get a 1,000 Maori on the Marae from me, buddy, and I'll come and talk to the whole lot. And then we can have, you keep them all respectful, and I'll come and I'll speak and I'll give the seminar and I won't water it down. I won't be woke and I won't be peace and I'll come and talk to the whole lot. How's that? There's a challenge for you. What you had in your last night, Julian, was a whole bunch of white people over 70 who, of course, they're going to agree with your views because that's what they came to hear. You didn't have Chinese people, Indian people, Filipino people, Maori people in that room. So, you know, don't give me that border dash, mate. <laughs> How do you know nonsense. you weren't in there? And I wouldn't, I would know? not you know waste my there? time, I would not waste my time getting a thousand Maori people to take time off work to come along and listen to all your drivel. So I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> all right. Could I if get you, an undertaking to... from both of you? You have talked today. I don't know we made a, a blind bit of difference or progress. <laughs> but would you both agree? And, Julian, there has been some uh, controversy. You said you talked to people. You weren't inciting civil war or armed uprising. You said you talked to people who said they were buying guns for the day. Can we both agree that even though it's difficult, or can we all agree that even though it's difficult, violence, shutting other people down... And removing anyone's rights in any situation is not the answer to the difficulties or the difficult conversation that we are having right now, buddy. Um, Sean, I've just come back from the states, and I spent three weeks in the deep south. And um, while I was there, I took the opportunity to speak with members of the Ku Klux Klan, um, talking about what. <laughs> You know, well, what's driving all this? And I can see exactly the same thing happening there because they said to me, America is a very fearful society. We're taught to be scared of every, everything that's new or different. And that's why the Klan continues to thrive. It's because you have this ongoing fear 
that something's going to change, that the world you understand yeah. and know is no longer be yeah. like that. And that's exactly the kind of drivel that Julian is pushing here. Yeah, but things he, are changing he, here, buddy. He's to buddy, look yeah, at, but look but at, look look at, look at policies around mean. health. Things are changing. You can't yes, deny that. that's right. I, I'm not denying it, but he is. <laughs> he's saying it's separatism, but it's not. It's an evolution. And it's, it's addressing the societal problems that we have. Okay. You know, uh, why why I ask you, which, would you problem? agree that violence against each other and cancel, and cancel culture is not the way to address whatever issues we have? No, not, violence is not the answer. That is a, a nice place to end for you. Julian, would you agree the same, that violence against those you disagree with uh, is not the answer to whatever problems right. we face? I have always said that. I said, I've said in my seminar, the only weapons I use are my brain, my mouth, and my pen. And we sold 350,000 of our books in 14 weeks, yeah. which proves the point. The pen is more powerful than the sword, and, and that's all we need. Weak people revert to violence, and we're not weak. Okay. I'm, can I just say thank you, both of you, for taking part this morning. Um, as I said, I don't know how much progress we've made, but at least being able to talk and engage, uh, I think, is a positive in what is a difficult conversation this country is having uh, with itself. So, Buddy uh, and Julian, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning, and I wish you both well. Thanks, Buddy. Yeah. Cheers. Still... Cheers. Uh, Buddy McKay and Julian Batchelor. Why did you make of that? I've got lots of texts there.